Hello everyone, my name is Brad Berholtz and I'm gonna walk you through the day six practical for the Boulder workshop. And we're gonna be talking about latent growth modeling and twin data. So just to show you where I'm starting from, I've got the Qualtrics survey opened here. I've got a login already done for the cluster and I've got my RStudio session open. So the first thing that we would typically do would we look inside here and we can see that we've got a variety of different folders change directory into the 2022 day six and we can see that inside here we've got all of the information that we're going to need specifically we've got three data sets data set one two and three right here we've got all of the functions neatly packaged in a separate R script. And then we've got the functions that we're gonna, or the, the script that we're gonna work with for the practical. I've already posted the linear, the quadratic, and the semi-parametric growth model answers in PDF form from the Qualtrics, as well as the uh, practical answers in an R script for you so that you can just walk through that, whatever is most convenient for you. So the first thing that we're gonna wanna do here after we've copied all of our data over is open up this LGC prac. And this is gonna just bring us right to the um, basic functions that we're gonna need. And you can see that there's about 217 lines. This is gonna be set into two separate exercises. So the first exercise is going to be determining which model fits data set one, two, and three most appropriately. And then we're going to pull out one of those data set model combinations and interpret the parameters for them. So we can start by walking through all the stuff that you should see in your, um, your folder. I'm assuming that you're well acquainted with all of this kind of stuff at this point. And we're just gonna say, my room number is Brad because uh, I'm the only one in this room right now. Okay, so the goal one is to match the data set with the appropriate latent growth models. So to do this, we're gonna load up the required functions and read in the data, and that's gonna be done basically within the script. So let's go ahead and do that right now. So that means we're going to highlight these sections right here, and we're just gonna hit run. Oh, notice that I did not change this. So in order to change this working directory, what we can do is go get WD, get WD open close paren, and we can see this pathway here is my working directory right now. So we can just set the working directory to that. And now if we type in get WD one more time, we can see that this is the working directory. And we can just paste that up here, I won't so that you don't copy it over when you do the when you do the um, the practical tomorrow. Then we can run the data files and get them right in there properly and take a quick look at the first six lines of each data frame um, using this head command. And you can see here we clearly have read in data. We can see here that we've got trial one underscore one, trial two underscore two, et cetera, all the way up to trial six. And then it starts over at trial one underscore two. So these first six uh, measures here are the first six measurement occasions for twin one. And these second six are the measurement occasions for twin two. And we've got a zygosity measure. So if we wanted to, for example, look inside the zygosity, uh, variable for data set one, we could just go table um, LG, LGC data underscore one dollar zig. And we would see we've got 1000 DZ twins and 1000 MZ twins. And that data structure is the same for all of them. So we don't have to worry too, too much about them. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to take LGC one, two, and three data and chop it into MZ and DZ twin groups. And it's gonna be MZ data underscore one or DZ data underscore one for LGC data one. And the rest follows pretty naturally from that. 
Okay, so this is basically just, we've read in the data, we're ready to start thinking about analyzing it. And just to refresh your memory, there's six waves with two twins. It's trial one to six for each person, for each twin. And the suffixes of underscore one or underscore two indicate which twin that observation belongs to. Okay, so now that we've loaded everything in, we're ready to start going. So the first thing that we wanna do is we wanna tell R which data frame that we wanna analyze first. And I've done this in one simple way. First, we just take the column names, the first 12 column names. Remember those are the trials one to six for twin one and trials one to six for twin two. And we're gonna put them in a Selvers uh, object. And then we can just look at it quickly. And then we're going to put MZ data underscore one and DZ data underscore one into a data MZ and a data DZ object. This is going to allow us to not have to flip between or edit the script too much. We can just put it here and we can use the rest of the script pretty easily. We can see here that we're always indexing the first uh, data frame for the first for the first analysis and run that. Okay. Then what we can start doing is we can start actually running the models. So what we're going to do first is run the linear LGC model for data set one, and we're going to look at the parameters. That's just the generally what you're going to do in practice. So what I've done here is I've put the lin ace LGC model and all the stuff that we need to do that into an R function in that um, LGC fun.r script. And I encourage you to take a look at it, but in order to avoid getting bogged down in coding today and focus more on the conceptual understanding of longitudinal modeling, what we're going to do is we're just going to we're just going to go through this um, real quick. So this LGC ace LGC, the lin ace LGC function takes an MZ data object, a DZ data object, a Selvers object, all of which we've created in the in the preceding lines up here and the number of waves that we're going to want so this is six waves um then what we're going to do we can just create that object right now then we can fit that model using mx run and put it into lin ace lgc fit then we can just look at the summary output of it and then we can just print the summary output to the screen Okay, so when we see this, we see we had 29 parameters that the MX run um, uh, function detected, and we can see we've got estimates for 29 uh, uh, estimates, which is, well, if you didn't get that, there's a big problem. Now, if we look down here, we can see a variety of different parameters. Some of them look pretty good. Some of them look pretty weird. And we can see here that this C parameter, the C11 parameter is really big and really negative as is the C22 parameter. And those, maybe they're not problematic, but they do look pretty suspicious to me. Um, we often see opposite signed intercept and slope parameters. So that's not necessarily an issue there, um, but these parameters for, for the latent C uh, components for the intercept and slope do seem a little bit weird. And then we see this giant number here, 11 and 10 for the first and last measurement occasions for the C variable. And those look pretty suspicious too. That's a substantial amount of variation to be included in one of those factors. So all of a sudden we're, all, we're not really thinking that this is the best model to fit just because of the parameters looking so peculiar. And we can see, the means of the intercept and the linear growth component, they're big. We don't really know too much about that. So that really isn't going to feature too much into our decision-making. So we can say, okay, well, some of the, some of the C uh, results seem peculiar, especially C11, C22, and the 
specifics for wave one and the specifics for wave six. So do we think that this linear LGC is gonna be the be best fit for the model? At this point, I'm tempted to say probably not. So while looking at the model, So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the quadratic LGC for data set one. And that's just the next batch of code right underneath here. We can run that all in a single go and start pulling out the model estimates. So we see here we've got 39 parameters. So we have an extra 10 parameters that we've estimated this time over the linear model. We can see that's matched here. So in this case, we've got fairly sizable A11, we've got a decent size A22, and still a reasonably decent size A33. Nothing's particularly large, nothing's super negative, so it's probably in good shape here. The next thing we've got here is um, reasonably sized C values here. Okay, so when we think back to the parameters that we had for the latent A, C, and E factors um, before, these models look much more realistic. These parameters look much more realistic. Now, when we look for the specifics, we're doing a pretty good job fitting the model to the data or fitting the data to the model. And we've still got some pretty big uh, linear intercepts and quadratic functions, intercept linear and quadratic functions, but We'll be able to take a closer look at that as we go forwards. So as we go back to the quadratic model, none of the parameters seem to be excessively problematic, but let's reserve Okay, so it might be, or it might not be the best fitting model for this data. Now let's run the semi-parametric latent growth curve model for the same data set. And again, all of the results are right here. So we can just plug those in and let's go up here and see what happened. Okay, so this is pretty exciting. We've got a warning message that it's code red. So it might not have converged to the best model fit. Typically, this, um, this is something that you'll be able to pick up automatically in the uh, parameters, especially because a lot of times when you get a code red, your standard error column is filled up with NAs. And that's a pretty good sign that we haven't reached the ideal model fit. But one thing that I like to do when we get a model that has a uh, code red is simply copy and paste the, the fitted object into an MX run statement like this and rerun it. And when we do that, you can see that the new model fit does not have a code red in it anymore, suggesting that the model now is fairly, or the optimizer is now fairly happy with the parameter estimates and the Hessian estimates of the model. And that's really important for the standard errors. Okay, so now that we've fixed that, Typically, I would leave this in the script so that if I came back to it before, but since you guys are going to be playing with these scripts tomorrow, I'm going to remove that. And we can just look at the summary again and look at what comes out. So remember, the semi-parametric model has a latent intercept and a latent slope and no quadratic function explicitly programmed. And we can see here that we've got a fairly decent sized uh, intercept variance negative covariance with the slope and a very small covariant or very small variance of the slope parameter. Similarly, we see the same pattern coming on with an even smaller variance of the quadratic. And then again, a very small variance of the quadratic from the E parameter as well. Our residual items here look pretty uh, decent. There's nothing that's automatically popping out. And you'll notice here that the key innovation with the semi-parametric over the linear or the quadratic uh, LGC models is that we're fitting factor loadings empirically to the data 
And so we can see the factor loadings being pushed in right, right here. So we've got for the second time, we've got three, four and a half, five and a half, and a six. And then we've got our intercepts and our means for the growth parameters here. So these look pretty good too. So when we go back and we say, okay, you know, is there anything that looks potentially suspicious? Well, the variant, the variances of the So the variances of the latent slopes are quite small and potentially problematic, but you know there's not anything that we can really judge by that. Okay, so again, we're into this maybe situation. So what we wanna do now is we wanna compare them on some sort of an empirical model fit criteria. And so the next set of rows here is really just um, taking the, um, model information criteria from the summary statements and packaging it up into a single object that we're calling info criteria. We're gonna give the row and column names appropriate to the models that we ran and the uh, statistics that we're looking for. And we're just gonna quickly run it. And so what we can see here across all three models and across all of the uh, different information criteria is that the quadratic model seems to be fitting best. And we can tell that because for the AIC and BIC information criteria, what we really are looking for is the smallest absolute value. Sorry, the smallest value. Um, so we can see 21,907 is definitely lower than 35,000 or 22,000, et cetera. Uh, negative 112,295 is less than any of the other uh, approximate uh, fit statistics. So we can definitely conclude that the quadratic LGC model fits better than the linear or the semi-parametric model. So when we say which model provides the best fit for data set one, we want to see the, we, we would get the quadratic LGC model. Okay. So while the statistics make a compelling case, it's really useful to look into the means, the expected means of the parameters and compare them to the actual data that we have. Because even though this model fits well, it might not actually do a great job in explaining the nuances of our data. And we can pick that up pretty quickly when we, when we look at the various um, means and compare them to the expected means and compare them to the actual data. So what we can do now is right in the next thing, what we're gonna do here is we're going to reshape the data from this wide format into a single long data frame. Basically, we're gonna take the first six columns of data frame one for the MZs and note that that's columns one through six, paste that right on top of seven through 12, which is twin two. And obviously this isn't the data set we're gonna analyze because we're breaking our family structures but it's really useful to do it this way in order to just plot the data and take a look what's happening. So we can do that. The next thing that we want to do is we want to figure out what the expected means are for our observed measurement occasions. And this is basically taking the means of the latent growth factors and multiplying them by the factor loadings. For some reason, I've coded this in such a way that we have to transpose the means in order to get them into a wide shape so that they're conformable for observation or for multiplication. We can run that quick. And we can take a quick look at what these means are going to look like. So we can see that we've got about 7 to 22 here for, for a range for the linear means. We've got three to about 18 for the quadratic means. And remember that's the best fitting model. And we've got almost exactly the same means for the semi-parametric model, which is really quite fascinating. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. 
So what we can see here is we can say, okay, let's um, plot the means. And so the first thing that I'm gonna suggest you do here is create a blank plot with the basic um, components that we're gonna look at here. So we're plotting uh, differential growth model trajectories for data set one. We know that the means go somewhere from zero to 23. So we can just make that, um, make that our Y limit for a dependent variable. And we're gonna color it white so that we, um, so that we can uh, just get a blank plot. And we can just run that, make this a little bit bigger for us here so we can see it when it comes out real nice and easy for those of you who have trouble seeing. And we can see here, blank plot. Now what we're gonna do is we're randomly gonna select 200 people. So that's 200 out of the 2000 people. So you want more, grab more. In my opinion, 200 is about enough to get a good sense of the trajectory of what's going on. And so we can see here, when we look directly at raw data, we can see it increasing and then it curving a little bit. Let's just make this a little bit smaller and we can see that curve come in a little bit nicer. Now what we can do is we can plot the means, the expected values of those means under each different model. And so we can see the linear is doing a pretty poor job. So it's getting the, uh, the expected value is bigger than almost all of the uh, observations at wave one. Eventually it's one of the smallest observations at three and four, and then it's one of the biggest again at time six. So that doesn't really map on very well to the shape of our, our model. And then for the quadratic, that looks nice and right down the center, right? And then we can look at the semi-parametric factor uh, means, and we can see they line up right on top. And if you remember back, the semi-parametric model fit much worse than the quadratic model. And one of the reasons that it fit worse, and we pointed out earlier, is that the variances of that quadratic term of that latent growth term in the semi-parametric model were very small. And that is definitely what's contributing to the misfit in this model. You can put some nice little uh, figure captions on here just to explain what we're doing. And, um, and then we can see there. So that's what we would have written in this box here. And we can see that this is basically what our figure looked like. Okay, so let's do the next thing for data set two. We're going to go back. And now that we've got everything ready in, all we need to do is change these three numbers to, from one to two. We can rerun this. And then we can fit the linear growth model to this one. Okay, now let's take a look inside and see what we've got here. Again, 29 parameters, same as before. This time, we can see that we've got reasonably sized A's, C's, and E's. So there's nothing suspicious necessary that's popping out. We can see here all of our residual variances are in a, a reasonable bar ballpark. So we're in pretty good shape, I think. Okay, let's go on to the quadratic model now. Hmm. Okay, 39 parameters, 39 parameters. Okay, good. Then we can see here, we've got decent uh, intercept and linear slopes, but our quadratic, the correlation between our quadratic slope and the intercept is very small, probably because there's almost no variation in the quadratic slope. And the quadratic slope and the linear slope is effectively zero as well. Hmm, I wonder what happens when you don't have a quadratic slope. We can see the same parameters dropping to zero in the C and the E models, again, implying that maybe the quadratic parameter isn't completely necessary. Our, our, um, Specific variances seem pretty reasonable, 
And we can again see that our quadratic mean here is effectively zero. So it's unlikely that this model fits the data very well. It's going to fit better than the um, linear model just because there's more parameters, but it might not fit significantly better than, and that's what we need to test. Okay, so let's go on to the final model here, the semi-parametric model. And what we can see here, oh, again, our semi-parametric model had a little bit trouble fitting. So, oh, so let's go ahead and we can run that one more time. And running it again has removed the uh, code six. We can get rid of that again. And then we can rerun these two lines here and we will be in good shape. So what we can see here is a decent chunks of variance, again, fairly small variance on this quadratic param or on this semi-parametric slope. Um, for all three variance components here, which is actually pretty interesting. Our residuals, again, are in the ballpark. So all three models seem to fit fairly reasonably well. And then when we look at the lambda coefficients for times two, three, four, and five, we can see a, a two, a three, a four, and a five, really indicating a quite linear relationship between time or the wave and the outcomes. So the next thing that we are, want to do is we want to take a quick look at our information criteria. So let's give this a little bit of a go over and run that. And what we can see here is that now our linear latent growth curve has the best fit. So um, slightly better, not nearly as different in terms of the quality of fit for the linear as it was for the quadratic uh, model in the previous data sets. But what we can really see is that the linear is consistently better. In some cases, in real data, your AICs and your BICs are not going to match, but in this case it does. So it really simplifies our statistical decision making. So if we go back to our um, if we go back to our Qualtrics survey, we can say, looking at the information criteria, which model fits data to the best? And clearly it's the linear. So now let's go back and take a quick look at what those graphs are gonna look like when we do that. So again, because of the way that we've coded everything, we can, ab above, we can just run this really quickly and we can look at the quadratic, the linear quadratic and semi-parametric means. Taking a look at these means will show us the general range that we want to make our plot, but it'll also show us that basically to three decimal places here, our values of the means are all the same. So if we go, negative two to about 10 here for our y axis. And we can plot this really quickly. And we can see a nice linear trend going from waves one to one, wave six, which is exactly what we'd have kind of expected based on the linear model providing the best fit. And we can see here that the linear model drives right through the heart of the data. We can see that the quadratic model lies right on top of it, effectively confirming the fact that our quadratic mean and our variances basically gave the same model fit as our linear function. And we can see that the semi-parametric model also tailors to the same observed means basically suggesting that all three models are finding the same trajectory, although differences in model fit relate to the number of parameters that we're estimating, the linear parameter, uh, the linear latent growth curve model having the fewest and therefore being the most parsimonious. And if this was our data, we could take this figure right here, obviously change the 
the waves around, maybe make the access, access labels a little bit more informative. And then we could go ahead and, um, and put this in our, in our manuscript. Okay. So we can say that all of the mean fell right on top of each other. Okay. And you can see that this is basically what our figure looked like. Okay, moving on to data set three. Again, all we need to do is change this from a two now to a three. We can run that. And we can run our latent growth curve for the linear model. And we see that this gives us a code green, which is generally okay when we look at the parameter estimates. Um, some of them look pretty funky, but nothing particularly bad. If we're really conscientious, maybe we, oh, maybe we could uh, fit this again from, from the solution. And we pretty much solved that there, so we don't have to get too excited about it. We can see here, that as with the first model, some of our parameters are just way, way out in outer space. We've got huge residuals for C and even some negative residuals here, even some negative residuals for E. So this doesn't seem like it's fitting our, our data very well. Wonder what the quadratic model is gonna look like. See here, we got a code red. Let's give that another quick run through. Oh, seems like it's red again. We can even run it a third time if we wanted to. In my experience, running it too many times doesn't necessarily get us better results after a while. Now, if we look at the parameter estimates, we can see we've got um, some pretty weird things going on again with the with the C. So that's interesting that the linear and the quadratic are giving us um, similar results. We've still got some negative uh, specific residuals, which is probably a bad thing. Um, but overall, uh, we fit the model and and we have some numbers that we can start interrogating. Finally, let's go for the quadratic model. And we can look up top here. This is the first time that we haven't got a code red with the quadratic model, so that's encouraging. Um, and we can start looking at the parameters. These parameters look actually pretty good compared to the linear and the quadratic models. They don't look huge and out of place. Um, our residuals here look pretty good for the A and the C and the E, which, which, is, which is quite encouraging. And we've got some lambdas a lot of people are going to find it difficult to interpret these directly, but if we then go and make uh, the plots, um, it'll be quite clear what, what those are supposed to be. Now let's just quickly run the um, info criteria. And we can see here that by far the semi-parametric model is really explaining our data much better than any of the other models, like substantially better. Okay. So going back to the Qualtrics, we can say that the semi-parametric model fits the, um, fits the data substantially better. Now, if we're gonna look at the means again, we can use the same code. We don't have to change anything. And we can look inside here. So our linear mean, goes from 12 to 48, okay, that's a good, okay, so our quadratic starts at two, goes up to 16, and then just kind of keeps on going, and then our semi-parametric mean kind of hits in this, in this area too, starting at, starting about where the linear starts and finishing a little bit closer to the quadratic. So let's now, change this from about zero. And since I've looked at this data before, we're gonna put the upper limit at 75. And we can kind of take a quick look at what the raw data looks like. And we can see here, 
we've got a general linear trend between waves one and three, and also a general, general linear trend between four and six, but we've got this big effect in the middle here. This could be something that we observe if we were to actually change our measurement instrument in the middle, and all of a sudden you've got a big shift in the measurement. Um, and that's not going to be captured particularly well by the linear model, which is kind of uh, Im unable to account for this, this kind of weirdness happening between wave three and four. It's also not going to account for the uh, quadratic model. And note that sometimes this quadratic model with this data goes negative sorry, a decreasing, and sometimes it's an accelerating curve because this data really doesn't fit the quadratic model very well. But as we noted before, the semi-parametric model is the best fit to the data. And we can see that we've got a nice linear increase between waves one and three, then a big jump, and then another linear increase between waves four and six. And we can just put a little legend on here and um, we can see we could have we could copy something like this into our manuscripts. So we, we would say that the linear and quadratic models don't fit well at all. Okay. So That's the first part of this tutorial. We're gonna start with a, um, a second part here after the responsible uh, conduct of research. And rather than plotting everything, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna work through just the quadratic model. Okay, so just to make sure that we're working through everything and we've got the data loaded properly, we're gonna rerun this section of code, which you can see in the um, in the top part here under interpreting the latent quadratic model. And that's just going to make sure that we're using the right data and we've got the right parameters and everything for our model. Um, So the summary of the parameter estimates is really useful for providing a general overview of our model, but in a lot of times what we would actually prefer is to look at the specific matrices. So the first question that we have is how can we get the means for the latent growth factors out? And there's really a couple different ways that we can do this. One way is we can look in this LGC fit model and look in the dollar output section. And then since our means are a matrix, we can go matrices, and then we can go um, down to the ACE, LGC quad ACE mean. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna provide us with our means. So those are the means for our latent growth factors. So we can just copy those right into the boxes. So 33.5, one, 12.2, and negative 4.5. And if we would wanted a hint, we could have grabbed, we could have hit this button here. And so the thing that if we knew what the matrix was called, we could have just used MX eval, the, the matrix name, and then our fitted object. So the means of the latent growth factors tell us the average level and the average change, either linear or quadratic, in the population. So the next thing that we want to do is we want to calculate the expected means for each wave. And so we'll, what we're going to do there is we're going to take the transpose, remember we're looking for the we're looking for the transpose of this matrix and we're going to oh and we're going to we're going to multiply it if i only could paste it into the right place 
We're going to multiply it by the lambda matrix here. And then we can see that these parameters here, this output here, is related to the um, is related to the uh, means of the observed factors for a quadratic model. And these are exactly what we saw previously. So we can just paste that code right into the box there and we're good to go. Note that this is the same code that we saw when we made the figures. So what is the covariance between the latent intercept and the latent linear growth factors? So in order to do that, we're gonna to need to pull out the covariance matrix for the, um, for the latent growth parameters. We can just use this full a, a lat plus C lat plus E lat object here. And we can see that that is gonna give us the covariance matrix here. So down the diagonal, we've got 1.75, 1.05 and 1.04 for our variances and then covariances between, or for the linear, is for the intercept, the linear and the quadratic functions respectively. And then we've got the covariance between the intercept and the linear, which is what we're looking for, the intercept and the quadratic, and then the linear and the quadratic. So this here is the answer that we're actually looking for. What is the covariance between the latent intercept and the latent linear growth factors? Negative 0.579. Okay. Now, one of the things that we should point out here is that we often want to talk about the correlation between the latent growth factors because that becomes then standardized. Um, and so in order to do that, all we need to do is go back here and wrap the MX eval for the covariance statement into a co to core function. And it's going to transform that covariance into a correlation matrix. And so we can say here is the correlation and we can round up to 40.428 when we paste it in here. So to interpret that, we would say the individuals who had the highest average level grew at, at a slower rate than those with a lower average. So what proportion of the variance in the latent intercept factor is accounted for by the A, C, and E factors? And again, what we're looking for is that variance component that we were just, that variance matrix that we were just looking at here. But instead of the whole thing, we're just going to look at the proportion that's a, C, and E. So what we can do here is we can just copy this element here. We can wrap this in parentheses and that's gonna give us our total variance. And then we can just say for A, this is the proportion in A or the A matrix divided by the total variance. Oh, and Make sure you get your parentheses right here. And we can see that approximately half or 53% of the variance is accounted for by A. We can do the same for C here by just changing it to C lat. And we've got 16% of the variance. And then for E, I think you've guessed it. About 30% of the variance, 31% of the variance. Okay. So the next question is, what is the proportion of covariance 
between the linear and the quadratic growth factors that is accounted for by A, C, and E. So from here, we can go right back to our matrices that we just looked up. And what we could see here is we've got, oh, is it, isn't, isn't that funny? 110% of the variance in the correlation between the linear and the quadratic is accounted for by A. So we can say 110%. That means that approximately 50%. Now we're up to 160% for those of you keeping track. And to compensate for that so that it all sums to one, we've got about negative 60% accounted for by E. So the question then is, how do you interpret the proportions of variance in the linear and the quadratic growth factors? And this is really one of those situations where because we've got opposite signs, the co-heritabilities make absolutely no sense to interpret. And so this is one of those gotchas in multivariate modeling. If you've got a negative sign for one of your variance components and a positive sign for another covariance component, then you can't interpret the, co the coheritability in a standard way. So we would say there is no There's no reasonable interpretation of these parameters. Okay. The last thing that we're going to do here is we're going to look at the A, C, and E residuals. So we can take these components here and we can just paste them in here. And we can see for the A residuals, uh, somewhere between 10% and 20 and 30% here. So we can say between. 0 0.10 to 0 0.30. For A, about 0.1 to 0.2. And for E, we've got about 0.1 to about to just over 0.3. So about the same as A. So again, most of the variation in A, C, and E is actually being contributed to the latent growth process, which is the important thing that we're trying to capitalize on here. Okay, so now we have finished. What we're gonna do now is we could download this PDF and they would save our responses um, and you can share these with your group if you're interested. I hope you've learned a little bit about latent growth modeling in twins, and I hope you're enjoying the Boulder workshop.